everyone. So the recording has started. Hello, everyone. Uh, here is the fifth lecture about modern Bayesian statistics. And today we will learn about how to perform Bayesian A-B testing. Uh, we will start from reviewing what is missing from classical A-B testing framework, what can be improved, and what are the weak spots that are very challenging to deal with. And uh, later on, we will learn what are the benefits of the Bayesian pipeline that are impossible with frequency statistics. And we will review it on one small example and follow it up on the coding session if we have enough time. And I hope we will do. Let's go ahead. As for the classical uh, A-B testing pipeline, the main decision process about whether the experiment is good enough is based on p-value. And p-value is uh, a bit complicated thing to explain. And sometimes, and or most of the times, people misinterpret this. However, p-value is used in thousands of research papers, in uh, production pipelines. So it is extremely popular and extremely misunderstood. Let's figure out if we understand p-value. Um, from, from initial hunch, uh, you can think that p-value is uh, something that relates to null hypothesis. And null hypothesis, for those who don't know what it is, is the absence of the effect at all. So if null hypothesis is true, then we don't observe any differences and our experiment is non-performant, non-successful. So when you try to explain p-value, you may say that if p-value is very small, then null hypothesis is not likely. So alternative is true. And the greater the p-value is, you may think that the more uh, realistic is null hypothesis. And you somehow relate it to, to the probability of changes and so on. And there is a rule of thumb that if p-value is small, smaller than 5%, uh, that means that we uh, accept the alternative hypothesis, meaning that we have observed the effect to enough confidence. So it feels like p-value is something we can explain uh, in, in very simple terms, but it appears that none of this what I talked about is true. So literally none of these uh, four statements. So p-value is very misleading. So it is about the null hypothesis, but on the other hand, it's not the probability. So how you interpret this is too complicated. The same goes with the confidence intervals. When you, uh, when you think about an interval from A to B, uh, so the values between A and B, you may think that, well, the effect size should be somewhere in the middle between those values. And if you ever thought in these terms about the confidence interval that you observed in linear regressions, conf uh, coefficients estimates in A-B testing, effect size estimates, well, you thought about the interval, not in frequency terms, but in the Bayesian terms. So it is the Bayesian interval that represents the most probable values of the hypothesis. And what is frequentist? Uh, frequentist interval is, is about, uh, it is about trying to catch the true effect size and 
the probability of how frequently you catch this interval, this estimate in your algorithm estimate. So, and it is not the same as most probable ethic sizes that explain your data. So if you ever want to explain an interval in terms that people understand, it will be the Bayesian way to explain things. And the Bayesian approach is to get this interval. And with traditional hypothesis testing framework, it is uh, quite challenging to get all the estimates done with p values because the, the less assumptions you have, the more complicated is uh, the statistics that is transformed to p value. And even with two non equal variances, it is kind of uh, nasty. And it is a lot of assumptions have, has to be, uh, have to be done before you apply uh, p-value framework. And with Bayesian statistics, you don't even think about uh, all those assumptions because all you need is your prior knowledge about the topic, about the effect sizes, and you don't calculate the p-value directly. You see on the statistics that you can interpret. And we will see how you can interpret what you can get from the Bayesian estimate. And to summarize what will be reviewed, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian interpretation will, is easier to explain to people and you can easily turn the estimates into action. But as usual, you have to, to understand the the domain about your the problem and understand what do effect sizes mean because without any idea about the effect size you can start the a b test and there are quite uh, a few things that you can look immediately when you perform the uh, bayesian inference so the higher density interval, region of practical equivalence, uh, base factor that I don't really uh, use in practice, but it is still useful to know. And a lot of custom things that uh, are mostly used in practice, even more often than density intervals and, and so on, because custom things is what is uh, really tied to, to the problem. Uh, highest density interval represents you the most probable outcomes uh, that you observe performing the A-B test. So if you expect a difference, the highest density interval would show you what are the possible differences, the effect sizes that explain changes in data. And you can easily relate it to uh, is the effect size is greater than zero, less than zero, if it is more than a certain threshold that you can ignore. So it's already something you can uh, deal with and turn into action. And then like confidence, inter confidence inter intervals from uh, classical framework, this interval will give you the full understanding about uh, pos all possible outcomes not just yes or no, if the hypothesis is uh, true or not. No. So do observe changes. So you get not only, not only the absence or presence of the changes, but also the magnitude of those changes. And that is really important when you try to convert it into actions and financial outcome. When you compare, a wide range of experiments. You can you can have non-equal sample sizes, and 
in Bayesian inference, you don't need to have equal split between train and test, like the baseline uh, subset and the experiment subset. So all you need is to have just a fraction of your population to participate in the experiment. And you can treat as the rest of the population that might be huge as the baseline to check that time dependent differences, for example. And that allows you to use many of the tests at once. And some experiments might be risky and you might want to have a small sample size for this experiment. Some experiments might be not that risky. And you are confident that they won't drive you to losses. And you may allocate them for a bigger sample size. And regardless, you can still compare these two experiments with big sample size and small sample size. What would be the difference is the confidence of estimate. If the sample size is big, then you will have a bigger confidence, obviously. And with, with small sample sizes, you, won't, you might need to wait a little bit longer to get an estimate you can trust that is trustworthy. Uh, yes, yeah, so there will be a way to do sample size analysis. Uh, that would be the uh, third part of the presentation. Uh, we will review it in the very end because it is uh, an advanced topic. Base factor is something that compares you the null hypothesis and the posterior inference. Where null hypothesis are your initial beliefs of what are the probable effect sizes. So uh, will be my changes above uh, 3%, 5%, and with uh, which amount of confidence should they go? I don't like this uh, statistics because it doesn't uh, turn you to actions that quickly and uh, you, in most cases, you might want to get the bigger picture of uh, what is what does you the posterior tell? But yet, if you are familiar to the frequentist framework, you might find base factor very similar to uh, p values. What I like the most are custom things you can query the posterior, and those include. What is the probab probability of effect size to be greater than zero, less than zero? If you compare two experiments, you can query if one experiment is better than another one, uh, maybe in terms of uh, conversions, uh, purchase amounts, or it might be some derivative statistics. It can be anything. If you have more experiments, uh, let's say seven experiments. And there is also a lot of sense in asking, what is the probability of this concrete experiment to be the best among others? And that is the third line uh, in this. And querying this for each of the experiments, you might find the one that is most likely to be the best one. And if you don't care about the costs of the experiment, it might be enough to turn this to action. Uh, another thing that is extremely useful and used in practice a lot is calculating profit out of your posterior. For example, if you have uh, effect size of in increasing, uh, of increased conversion probability and one user will turn uh, turn into some dollar amount and you might want to calculate profits 
uh, achieved from the experiment to to the whole population. Uh, you might cut something to uh, what is not interesting. For example, like we ignore everything that gives us less than one hundred dollars. Otherwise, we treat the experiment uh, performant and useful and turn it into production. But in order to do that, we need to figure out how to calculate profit out of our effect sizes. And usually it is quite simple because a Bayesian model is something you can understand. Uh, if you want to be risk aversive, you may calculate the quantiles of your profits. Uh, let's say you're not satisfied with an experiment that will, in worst case, drive you to losses. You may also always want your experiment give you profits, even in worst case, even if they don't, even if in worst case they're uh, not super, uh, if not, if for uh, return on investment is not that huge, you're still satisfied with it not being negative. So with Bayesian framework, you can get a lot of interpretation that is very flexible and it turns a yes or no answer that was before with frequentist framework into something that you can really play with, explain to people, and explain to people that don't know statistics at all. So if you want to explain something to uh, a financial guy, you may say that in worst case, your return on investment won't be less than 5%. And that would be amazing. With uh, frequency statistics, uh, all you would say is, oh, this experiment is uh, all the, this experiment has uh, significant effect size. And the next question would be, how big is this effect size? Uh, there will be only the point estimate of this effect size and no idea about how variable is this effect size and how trustworthy is the point estimate. And there is no idea about um, what is the worst case of implementation. Maybe standard deviation changed and that makes your experiment risky. But with traditional tools, you can figure out if it's true or not. Uh, like frequentist A-B testing, Bayesian A-B testing can work on various types of problems like discrete observations where you measure conversions on the website, uh, follows to some links or clicks on banners, or first query click and, and, and so on. Uh, continuous observations are obviously possible where you have read times, uh, like purchases in the grocery. Uh, even if your purchase is uh, the discrete choice between, like there, there might be a product, let's say nuts. If you go to, to the grocery, you might want to buy something else, but not nuts. And your purchase probability for this particular product would be zero uh, for some, period of time and then it'd be no zero. And it is still the continuous observation yet complicated to work with regular tools. If you want more uh, sophisticated analysis and increased sensitivity of A-B testing, uh, you might want to use a coupad method to reduce variance of the estimates. And as coupad is nothing more than a predictor model with uh, binary uh, treatment, uh, treatment effect indicator. You can turn any statistical model into your coupad model and figure out if the treatment effect took place 
uh, with the Bayesian tools. So it is obviously possible with, uh, within two uh, frameworks, Frequentist and Bayesian one. Uh, there is yet another thing that will help you to work with A-B testing, and these are hierarchies. With hierarchies, uh, you may have not only one treatment group, but three or 10 treatment groups. They may be scattered along the geography uh, in some regions that may be very similar or not at all. And with Bayesian hierarchy, you may share the knowledge about that effect sizes between similar groups should be indeed similar and effect sizes for non-similar groups um, shouldn't be similar. With absence of similarity, uh, it would be only based on the population effect size. With similarities, let's say, geographical similarities closer uh, groups will have similar effect sizes even if they if even if the groups are unbalanced that is really helpful in doing uh, geographical leaf tests for marketing but before we go to set up a bayesian a b testing model we need to figure out our uh, uplift priors. And uplift prior is uh, the relative change upon the baseline. So with the absence of F, uh, effect, your uplift is zero. If you expect increasing 5%, that is relative to the baseline, uh, then uh, you may put some standard deviation on, on this prior around zero. And uh, let's say we have uh, an idea about uh, should we uh, about our marketing campaign. And a thought experiment. Uh, we're about to change a banner on the wall in our grocery. Uh, should it lead us, lead us to something that uh, increases our uh, average build in 1000%? Well, a very doubtful it will, it will do. But maybe it is plus 100%? Well, highly unlikely. But yet, if you compare it to 1000% increase, well, increasing it by two times is much more likely than by order of several magnitude. Uh, that's very hard to agree. Some realistic case actually deals with uh, much smaller numbers like 10% or 3%. So this third experiment um, tells you and brings you to uh, some estimate or guesstimate that makes sense for your application. That may be even uh, non-symmetric. So increase might be more possible than decrease uh, in the uplift. So whatever that tells you something more about the effect sizes, is really helpful to establish good priors. And you may go to a discussion table, discuss with your marketing team uh, what they think about their, their campaign and whether it leads to uh, which amount of increase of or decrease of uh, sales or any other metric. And if you nail, down, nail it down to uh, let's some possibility of it being no more than 
three uh, percent increase or three percent decrease that is already something you may put into math and treat as prior and the workflow of performing an a b test uh, i'm meeting this group split with certification is about setting up the experiment and figuring out if it is if it should take uh, one week or 10 weeks what should be the sample size uh, it also includes the idea about the effect size or the uplift uh, if it is plus minus three percent or plus minus one percent which will be very valuable because uh, traditional frequencies framework uh, ignores any difference between uh, one thousand percent increase and one percent increase it is just uniform in all, among all the possibilities and then of course the interpretation uh, you should interpret your outcome uplift uh, very carefully and turn it into something actionable So let's say we have uh, a binary experiment. A binary experiment that also only includes uh, clicks on a banner. And it will have the only uh, variable we need to estimate the probability of conversion and the uplift of, uh, of the change on the website. Of course, we have some additional information that is very useful uh, in our pipeline. Of course, we have the historical uh, conversion probability that we can go to managers and ask them to get some statistics. And the marketing team can make a guesstimate if a change is dramatic or very conservative, uh, would it drive into many new customers or or no. So this information we can for sure get from some sources. And if we look into what are the tools to set up a proper prior for this, it can be better distribution with mean and variant mean and sigma parameterization. Uh, I understand that there might be not only the math audience or and manager and managers, but yet this talk is uh, going to be a little bit technic more technical than others. So with a better distribution, uh, we can get the mean estimate and the sigma and turn it into alpha and beta that are. Uh, natural uh, the natural parameterization of uh, better distribution. So we convert this knowledge about what is the baseline minimum and what is the expected uplift of, of the change, the sigma. And out of this, we can get a really informative prior for, for the uplift. Uh, and if an example, we have an average conversion probability to be 5%, and our change is very conservative and would lead into uh, plus minus 5% increase or decrease, we can set up the following priors. So the uplift is 5%. A twenty percent relative change. Uh, so we turn it into uh, sigma bar and 
p bar and put into our better distribution to get the uplift. Uh, well, we need to be very careful about uh, if it is an absolute change of uh, that it would be uh, sigma uh, bar, or it is the relative change, and that would be the uh, delta bar. So better distribution is uh, can be used in a really task a specific way uh, that gives you a very interpretable and just prior distribution. Another thing that was uh, asked in, in the Q and A uh, about how to choose the sample size. It also includes the dilemma about not only the effect size, but also about the accuracy of the test. So we need to somehow balance between efficiency of our pipeline and uh, sample size that is required for the pipeline. And of course, uh, everybody wants the sample size to be zero. Like we need, we need answers just yesterday and without any data uh, all we have is our prior distribution and that's why we need very informative prior distribution it shouldn't lead us to action without any data so your prior distribution is something that is very conservative and traditional uniform distribution among all the possible conversion probabilities is of course nonsense you can't expect any of this range The way how it is done in Bayesian workflow is parameter recovery study. So to get an idea if your A-B test is efficient and uh, how much data you need to get a good estimate of the uplift, you need to do the uh, recovery study. So, and it includes generating data from all the possible configurations with different effect sizes. So you figure out which effect sizes are detectable at which sample size. Then you pretend you don't know anything about uh, your data and about generation process and only deal with your priors. You run the inference and then compare if it leads you to action that indeed made uh, makes sense compared to the generation process or it, it is conservative enough to ignore something else. And out of this uh, parameter recovery study, you will figure out which uh, data set you need to get a good estimate. Maybe your data, set, data size could be too big uh, to get a an estimate for a very small uh, sample size. So this is something that will definitely lead to actions. And the way we treat, we may treat the efficiency of our A-B testing pipeline is setting up some uh, threshold where the uplift uh, where the uplift should uh, go above to turn the experiment into successful experiment. Uh, for example, we need uh, the uplift to be greater than a sigma bar. Then uh, what we will ignore is what is below this uh, threshold. And if it is below the threshold uh, in a negative way, then uh, this experiment is uh, just uh, just wasteful. So we ignore everything that is uh, below minus threshold and not uh, ignore everything between minus threshold and threshold and treat 
a good experiment is those who overcome this threshold. And we need to decide a proper N, a uh, number of samples that we need to wait until to make a decision. And that may vary from very few examples to a lot. So we need to check everything. And a good idea to uh, a good idea of metric to use in this pipeline is to use a uh, rock oak. Rock oak will give you a sense of uh, how better you are compared to a random guess, given your priors. <clears throat> so with prior, you all you know is uh, the effect size should be somewhere between minus sigma and plus sigma. So it doesn't really <clears throat> tell you anything about if a particular experiment is good or not. Only after inference and getting data, uh, you know the answer. And if the answer is correct, you know by comparing by comparing it to uh, generation values. Uh, let's find out how it works uh, in theory and uh, how you would implement it in practice. So you sample P uh, hat from your prior distribution that are your prior beliefs. Uh, then you use use it for data generation. And first you need to set the label of this uh, generated experiment, synthetic experiment. If the sample P hat is above the threshold, it is a good experiment. If it is below the negative threshold, it is a bad experiment. And it may be natural if it is somewhere in between. So there are three labels uh, uh, as a possible outcome. Uh, it can be the classification uh, task. Uh, it can be treated as a classification task. The, the target, however, might be much more complicated and include your domain expertise. But the simplest one is to figure out if experiment is successful or wasteful. And when you do the uh, Bayesian inference, what you get in, uh, in return is uh, posterior probability, posterior distribution. And out of this posterior distribution, you may, may calculate, and we know how to do it uh, from the plots uh, from the above slides, uh, whether the experiment is above the threshold, what is the probability of it being natural, and what is the probability of it being wasteful. And those probabilities yet calculated on the posterior distribution can be treated as uh, probabilistic predictions of a traditional machine learning model. Why not? Uh, uh, logistic regression gives you probabilities as uh, predictions. So here you go. But your predictor is a Bayesian model that takes in account your prior expertise uh, and data. And if you do this, the following or simulation for all possible sample sizes that you care about, uh, you calculate uh, Roka for all the sample sizes within sample size. Uh, and these uh, rock hook estimates give you the idea about uh, what is the balance between the efficiency and the data size required. And the picture might look as following. For a small data size, uh, rock hook is somewhere uh, around uh, 0 0.5 meaning that in 50% chances you are 
better than random, but who is not better than random in 50% uh, in 50 chance? Everybody wants to be much more efficient than random. And this value usually starts uh, from uh, 0 0.8, like 80% better than, 80% chance to be better than random, 90% better than, percent chance to be better than random, and so on. So you have uh, one of the constraints. It is either time or the quality of the analysis. And then you look at the table or the plot and figure out which data size you need to be uh, efficient to a certain extent or um, how bad you are given a specific data, uh, data size or sample size. So if you get a request to perform analysis on 1000 observations, given your priors about the experiment, and you see that uh, you're not really better than random, you might want to totally ignore the A-B testing pipeline and just make a guesstimate based on your expertise rather than testing on this small data size. I'll request a longer period to perform the A-B test. So it will indeed lead you to a good discussion about what to expect from a particular A-B test. And every experiment is unique, meaning that it may have uh, its own specific uh, prior priors about the uplift, about their magnitude, and this will be all comparable between the experiments uh, if you compare the same metric. So after the inference, you need to, to choose uh, something that will, will be your best or candidate for production. And the best metric to do, uh, to use is uh, money metric, the one that connects you to profits. So if we have two experiments, it is just for simplicity, you may have um, dozens of, of those experiments. And you know the audience, of your website. Um, you might also have a customer value as uh, your proxy for money effect, y yet your customer value might be uncertain. Let's say it comes from uh, LTV model. Uh, it can be any, or it might be different scenarios that you will later compare. Uh, your monetization, or profits uh, may be computed as a uh, number of additional users that use the button or service minus the implementation cost. Uh, you may also include the discount in time if your uh, production pipeline will last for a couple of years. Uh, you may also include this uh, discounting factor and discount the initial investment into profits you take in account to say if the experiment or initiative is good enough to be productionized. And then you of course use the posterior to calculate the uh, possible and all possible outcomes of putting something into production because well, implementation cost you might be decently certain about uh, to a certain extent what they might look like. Uh, you might put scenarios on a user customer value or different scenarios on implementation costs or different scenarios on a discounting factor if it leads to increased or decreased risk in time. 
And with all these uh, scenarios, you compare all the experiments and see if some of the factors leads you to a uh, negative area or drives into a positive area, uh, decently robust. And you compare it to all the uncertain variables that you can only estimate out of data. So those are uplift, uplifts. So on small data, you are really uncertain about the uplift, but yet you can use it in the simulation. So you know, to summarize, uh, Bayesian A-B test helps you to frame your classical statistical and frequentist test is something that you can extend into interpretable analysis, uh, meaningful priors that will save you from outliers, will allow you to work on small data and with many experiments at once. Um, you will be able to set complicated likelihoods. And as I see, we have a lot of time to do hands-on uh, practical session after the lecture to set a complicated likelihood for, for an A-B test. And uh, you, you can still use similar things to plan your experiment as you, uh, as you may be familiar from frequentist approach. So it is the, to deal with um, the sample size and uh, efficiency of your A-B testing pipeline. And you can use the posterior to turn your analysis into action and to something you can explain to others using loss functions, uh, profits, uh, e economic models, or scenario testing that checks the robustness of the hypothesis you, uh, that you check. If you want to learn more about uh, how you can use uh, A-B testing in your company, or how to turn it to, to the next level, you can set up a call on Google Meet or write me directly on LinkedIn. Uh, in case you have uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer them in Q&A. Uh, I'll start from the beginning. Uh, the first question, uh, how would you, how would a Bayesian uh, A-B testing deal with multiple alternatives, alternative hypotheses in A-B testing? When it is necessary to control for multiple comparison? Uh, could you explain this on some examples? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, unlike the frequentist approach, you don't need to control for multiple comparisons because what you compare is your uncertainty about the outcome of specific experiment. And you can have many of these experiments compared and no correction is needed because uh, you compare random values, your uncertainties in the outcome. And they are all at the same scale. You compare apples to apples, the outcome of one experiment on metric and an outcome on similar experiment or very different experiment on the same metric. So it is really about comparing apples to apples in a probabilistic way. Uh, and some example will follow in the practical session. Um, the next question. Uh, can you talk about any tips on choosing likelihood distribution? Normal student T gamma for continuous observations? Uh, well, yes. So uh, every likelihood distribution is about making assumptions on your observational model. Um, if you compare normal distribution to student T distribution, it is about assuming whether you have outliers or not. So, Student T is like normal distribution with outliers. 
And if, if you assume you have outliers, this additional assumption leads you to the choice of student T distribution. On the other hand, gamma distribution is an assumption that all your observations are positive. And then you can uh, figure out if you need gamma distribution or log normal distribution. And whether it feels uh, easier to work with. Uh, the next question is about examples for multivariate Bayesian A-B testing. Um, well, the examples, one of the examples, and we will actually look at this example uh, after the lecture uh, in Jupyter. It is about making a choice uh, whether I buy a specific product. And then um, after this discrete choice, we choose the amount of purchase. So it will lead to indeed the multivariate Bayesian A-B testing about the probability of purchase and the possible quantity of purchase. And usually they're quite disconnected if you look at the uh, tables or from purchases in a grocery. So somebody buys a lot of uh, Coca-Cola. Now some people don't buy Coca-Cola at all. And here, here you get the probability of purchase and number of bottles. Uh, the next question is about uh, sensitivity in inference due to wrong prior distribution assumed. Uh, well, your prior distribution constrains you to not take bad actions. If you make a mistake in your, like literally you can't make a mistake in prior distribution. Uh, uh, I mean that um, unless it is absolutely absurd. So if you uh, really go to, to the table and discuss uh, what is the possible uh, increase in sales and you don't talk about absolute plus 100%, then if you, if you're at least certain to um, order of magnitude, then it is uh, helpful. So if you think about uh, increase in sales and you're de trying to guess if it is plus 1% or plus uh, 3%, then, well, this doesn't make a lot of uh, difference in uh, how what actions uh, you will take and what uh, posterior distribution you will observe. But if you decide about 1% uh, and 10% increase, well, yes, yeah, so then it is a discussion on a different scale. And uh, you should argue a lot about if you are conservative or opportunistic. And if you choose the conservative prior, that I uh, use uh, plus minus 1% compared to plus minus 10%, then uh, you should expect that in most cases, um, you would only take action if the experiment is that good. And if, it, if you have the uh, power distribution that is wider, then you will, you will take action uh, frequently. But in the first place, it shouldn't go to absolute amounts. And that is what I'm very uh, focused on. Uh, you shouldn't discuss the Bayesian model if you can't in interpret things that you're dealing with. Uh, the next question. What would you say is analogous to the frequentist power of tests with respect to priors in Bayesian statistics? Uh, with respect to Bayesian statistics? Yeah, so this is what I called um, the parameter cover study. So power analysis can tell you, uh, given your alpha and beta, uh, 
in frequentist A-B test, what should be the minimum detectable effect, uh, effect size given uh, my data size? Or what should be the uh, probability, what should be the number of observations to take action and to estimate the uh, estimate the minimum detectable effect size. So this is uh, very related to the power analysis in a sense. Uh, the next question. Uh, how you to do A-B testing for continuous variable if continuous variable can take negative values to refunding, returning orders. Um, well, this, this is a whole series of actions that take uh, probability of purchase, probability of a refund, uh, and, and so on. So, uh, it will be on a discrete choice of purchase or returning a product and the amount of uh, return. So a multi-stage model. We will deal with a similar model when it managed to answer all these questions. It will be the probability of purchase and quantity of purchase. Uh, the next, I'll let me answer those three questions and let me go to to the practical session because we have uh, half an hour left. I think more questions will emerge uh, during the practical session. Um, in some articles mentioned, one of the advantages of uh, the Bayesian approach is that it is most likely to accept the variant that is just slightly better than control. Uh, does it mean it tends to accept slight reverse options by mistake too? Um, as for these articles, I would double check their priors. If they use uh, the uniform prior of uh, the conversion probability estimated out of the data, uh, then the prior is uh, very opportunistic because uh, it means that given your experiment and your idea that you check on data, uh, you expect that the conversion probability may vary from zero to 100%, which in 100% cases is nonsense. You don't expect such conversion probability. And if you indeed use this prior, that is very opportunistic, then even small amount of data may lead to estimates that are, are huge from the domain perspective. If you use a conservative informative prior that takes into account your assumption about um, increase of sales driven by the campaign, then it, it won't lead you to um, that uh, sensitivity and the sensitivity would be just due to what is allowed to vary uh, from the prior and data you observe. Uh, the next question, how do you, how to do A-B testing for continuous variable if control variable can take its turn? Uh, how do we know if we have a good uh, distribution? Uh, we should plot the prior predictive. That's the way to go. If a prior predictive gives you uh, measurements uh, that you can interpret that are not, not nonsense, then it is a good prior distribution. You should only guess by order of magnitude, and that is already satisfiable to perform the next analysis. And this is what you should always do.
Well, the same for prior distribution, I guess. Well, uh, let's go to the practical session. And let me share my screen with Jupiter. So, thanks to ChatGPT, I have a very nice story that is shared uh, on the link that uh, should be visible in the chat. That's something you can read in spare time. That was very fun. And there is, uh, the, and this story is about a grocery where you sell products. And our data looks like this. You have the observed quantity of products purchased uh, in a specific store or a specific campaign that you, uh, where you run the A-B test. Uh, so we see that sometimes uh, quantity purchased is just zero and there are non-negative values of uh, product pur products purchased. We also see that there are three alternatives, three hypotheses that we check um, with an ABC test. And let's assume that our data is continuous. Uh, regardless, we see integers in our data because the continuous case is slightly more interesting than the discrete one. And as for campaigns we run, there are three. The one is about uh, discounts on quantity purchased that, uh, that makes users to buy more products, uh, yet we have to take into account the discounts. So it might not be, uh, it might not lead to that big increased profit as we think. Uh, we might also, just only sometimes advertise discounts. And we also try like daily deals for specific, specific items. And since we're a grocery store, we don't expect changes to be above uh, 5%. Because you know, people come there quite frequently and are very familiar with what we sell there. And uh, they're very sensitive to price changes and what is going on in the grocery. So given these assumptions, uh, we might want to build a Bayesian model Uh, so the first thing is uh, the discrete thing about the purchase, at least the discrete choice. And this discrete choice comes from a categorical distribution of if it if it, there are many actions and from a um, Bernoulli distribution in our case. So with this Bernoulli distribution, we have some probability of purchase. Uh, then after the choice is done, 
uh, if C is uh, positive, then we take an action. If C is one, we take an action and buy some amount of product. And it can be reflected in um, quantity equals to So in case C is one, uh, then uh, quantity is uh, simulated from log normal distribution, with some mean, and sigma. Then, if uh, our customer didn't make uh, the purchase, then Q is just zero. So this discrete choice uh, model is exactly that is very common in uh, groceries uh, or and retail. Uh, there is a question in Q and A. Uh, thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, the next question is, uh, how are we handling multiple purchases done by a user? Are we aggregating it? Uh, how do we model multiple conversions, uh, purchases multiple times as Bernoulli? Well, uh, this model and this data doesn't uh, distinguish between users. So there is no user ID for a specific uh, bill. We only have um, we only have purchases. If we have user ID uh, on the side, that will uh, turn us into yet another model. We can st we can still estimate the overall uh, effect of the campaign but it will allow us to 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 calculate uh, maybe customer lifetime uh, value or something else depending on how much data in addition we have um, and here we only deal with uh, uh, non-aggregated raw purchase uh, data just like you uh, get to to the grocery in the end of the day or in the end of the month and ask them to show you all the records in the uh, database. And there is some historical data that is very useful to take in account um, and that for many years the uh, average purchase, if it takes place, was uh, somewhere near 97. And people bought the product in 28% cases. That's, that seems to be a very useful product. Maybe it's uh, some kind of milk or bread that people buy uh, weekly. Well, so let's start with uh, probability of purchase. As I said, uh, it makes a lot of sense to use uh, better distribution for these purposes. And for mean estimate, uh, we have uh, our historical baseline 
26 uh, percent that uh, we observed for many years for this specific product. Uh, so our average would be uh, 0 0.26. And we are trying to, uh, some of the company uh, campaigns are aimed to increase the probability of purchase uh, for this specific product. Uh, yet we, yet we are unsure about uh, for how much. And uh, we decided on uh, talking to people who work in the grocery, showing them the examples of uh, materials. Uh, they say that it won't uh, drive more than by 5% more or less. And for one of the materials, they say that this shouldn't really matter for purchase probability. And it becomes slightly less than for others. So for two uh, experiments, for two campaigns, we think that they should affect the uh, probability of purchase. And for other one, we are less uh, that certain about it. And it is uh, safe to place a different uh, prior for a specific experiment. Uh, then, uh, what about the average for chase probability? Uh, we have the historical baseline value of uh, 97. So we, we can put a mode of this distribution to, and we have log normal distribution. And we can put this mode around this value and it will be uh, numpy log 97. And we don't think that the purchase amount will vary more than 5%. Uh, just a reminder for those who find uh, this parameterization uh, to be a little bit uh, new. Uh, when you work in log domain, uh, all your observations are in the relative scale. Uh, error bars are also in the relative scale. Uh, so if I put here uh, 0 0.05, that means that my estimate about the mean is uncertain to 5% error bar. If I, were, if I were on the real scale, I would multiply my plus minus 5% by the uh, mean estimate to make it uh, relative to, to the magnitude. So be careful when you work on relative scales and uh, correctly interp interpret the error bars. There is, of course, variation in average or in purchase amounts. So we not only look on the purchase probability, but also on the purchase uh, amount deviation. Uh, if you want to put this uh, error bar to be uh, 5% or 10%, we can do that. We have no idea about uh, 
what is the variation of our data? And we can place a very non-informative price there. So if I, if our error bar is plus minus 5% or 10%, we should log this value for the mean of, of the standard deviation and uh, put some variation on, on the uncertainty of this estimate. So it would be 10% uh, uh, plus minus uh, 10% times 20%. Then we should set up the likelihood. And for the likelihood, we have the discrete choice again to either buy the product or abandon. So to buy the product, we have probability P and Dirac Delta is no purchase. Uh, so one minus P is if we don't buy a product and with probability P, we buy the product. And our likelihood is the mixture distribution where we allocate the weights uh, properly according to to the chosen experiment in case of we don't buy anything there is Dirac delta in case we buy something uh, we observe it coming from log normal distribution with specific mean and uh, standard deviation and it can be two, there can be two variants of, of this model. Uh, one has a common standard deviation across all the stores. Another one has uh, a dedicated deviation from average, uh, standard deviation of purchases. And I think we would like to rather estimate a common uh, standard deviation of purchases and our model would look like this. Then we observe uh, our data and let's sample. Okay. Let's put into arrays. It, it will take a while to sample and compile, but it is quite fast in uh, sampling. Well, uh, the first thing we can, we should make sure is uh, the trace plot. So we have our estimate on the purchase probability. Let me apply the styling. Well, 
that's much better. So we see that uh, the probability of purchase is uh, different for all the experiments. And the amount of purchase is also uh, quite different. Average amount of purchase is quite different for different experiments. And we have an idea about the variability of our data. If we want to include the uplift in, in the model outputs, we can calculate it with uh, deterministics. So we calculate PM deterministic. Uh, It doesn't plot me delta. What a pit. Well, uh, delta P uh, would be the baseline. P minus the baseline uh, divided by the baseline. So that would give us uh, the relative change that we observe uh, in the experiment. Uh, we can do the same with, with mean and uh, it will call this delta mu. So we exponentiate mu because it is on the log scale because of the likelihood. Uh, we subtract the baseline and divide the baseline by the baseline. So now we will have two more recordings uh, in, in the trace. It will sample as fast, yet we will have an additional information about the outcomes of the A-B testing. Uh, there is a question. Why are the components of uh, the mixture uh, direct delta and log normal? So direct delta comes from the discrete choice of no purchase. So it will be the deterministic uh, zero amount of uh, quantity. And the log normal distribution is when you make a choice to purchase some amount of product, you choose um, what amount to, to buy. So it is a positive number because you already made a decision to purchase. And that's why we need two components. One is to buy the product. Another one is to go out without a product. Uh, if I didn't answer the question uh, or you have other questions, uh, feel free to type them in, into Q and A. All right, and now we have um, a better picture of what is going on in our experiment because we compared uh, re compared the results the, the results to the baseline, and the relative change for p for some experiments seems to be are greater than zero for other experiment is less than zero. And we're very uncertain about uh, the green experiment. It, the green experiment also drives us uh, badly 
to decrease the amount of purchase and other experiments are quite good in increasing uh, sales. Uh, the trace plot might be really helpful to, to have to compare the experiments on them on the same scale. And we can say that we ignore everything that is less uh, in between 5% increase or decrease. And all the experiments in, in this sense would be valuable. One of them is uh, driving us significantly downwards. Others, others look good. All right. Um, what we can do is to use our distribution to uh, figure out, and we are actually on time, I'll show just this example before I finish. Uh, so we will figure out uh, how much does it cost us to implement the discount, the discount option. And the discount looks like uh, gradually increasing the discount depending on how much you spend. Uh, we can use uh, Pastero pre Predictive to sample from what would be uh, the outcomes from data we see. And we sample the observation. It will include the discrete choice between no purchase and actual purchase and the amount of purchase. Let's see how it looks like. So we get the posterior predictive, we get some purchases, draw ops team two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it should have been indexed. Let's just get the raw values. So, faster predictive. Ops while is shape. So looks like this. So the first two dimensions 
uh, the sampling dimensions, and the rest are observations which are unbalanced. Uh, then we can compare the first option. So it is the real price that the real money that comes up, comes to us from from people that purchase the product. Discounted purchase and non-discounted purchase. And the non-discounted non purchase is is the one where we don't implement the The, the discount mechanism at all. But I actually, I'd like to compare it to, to the baseline. And it would be a little bit more involved. Let's get some plots down to, to see the, uh, the cost of the of the discount. Um, that um, so, yeah, which is data store. to index uh, the oh, let's do that for the first for the first grocery store Let's verify that it is indeed what we want. And it feels like it is. All right. Uh, non discounted purchase minus discounted purchase is what we pay for for the marketing campaign. Well, yes. And here is the distribution of how much we spend on the discounts. Uh, I think we can is uh, we can just ignore all the zeros. Uh, we can ignore all the zeros because if user doesn't by our, our product, we don't pay for his discount. So 
So we only need something that is greater than zero. So here's the distribution of uh, dollars. We pay for users to be more active and for them to buy more products. And whether it's in this investment is, is good. Uh, it is what we, uh, what we should decide. But this is something that you can only get if you estimated the purchase probability and the quantity together. Without these two, these two parts, uh, this is just impossible to estimate. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in Q&A. Otherwise, we are on time. Uh, so the question, uh, what is what does the horizontal axis mean? The horizontal axis is, uh, it is the uh, means uh, how much do we spend on, on discounts we advertise to our users. So we pay for users to be more active. And this is the distribution of how much we pay. So these are uh, losses from implement implementing the discount program because obviously users will be more active and we have to pay for them being more active. Um, well, I think we're on time and maybe let's finish the recording. And thank you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach me on LinkedIn or book a session on Google Meet.